Kerala State Chapter President Dr. Muhammad Abdul Nasir Sir, ISA Kerala Secretary Dr. Benil Isaac Matthew, and all the delegates from different parts of our country. With immense pleasure, I would like to say that Corona pandemic restrictions have had a positive impact on us. Our city branch activities actually are taking place in every month in online platform. And we are utilizing online platform and our time also in this restriction time. With the help of our uh, enthusiastic leaders like uh, Dr. Vengiragiri, Dr. Abdul Nasir Sir, Dr. Sashidharan, Dr. Bini Laisak, we could arrange international faculties like Dr. TVS Gobal and uh, Dr. Sandeep Diwan for our monthly CMEs. I'm sure that today, today's presentation is going to be a benefited for all the practicing anesthesiologists. I heartily welcome Dr. TVS Gopal sir for today's program and I welcome all the leaders and the delegates for today's evening. I'm concluding my words by inviting Dr. Muhammad Abdul Nasir sir for his address. Thank you sir, over to you sir. Okay. Thank you Dr. Jalil. Respected uh, past national president Dr. Valvaskar. Our guest and faculty today, Dr. T.B.S. Gobal, President-elect Dr. Vengadagiri, also our active secretary, Dr. Binil Isaac Matthew, other leaders, and uh, members of ISAB. The state has already initiated a lot of uh, high standard academic programs, both for the postgraduates and the practitioners. I'm very happy that uh, Malapuram City Brand is joining at us in the same momentum, organizing regular programs with the help of uh, our international faculties. To start with, they have uh, initiated uh, the lectures on regional anesthesia. Last time we had, uh, we had the upper limb blocks by Dr. Sandeep Divan. The next two sessions will be by our eminent uh, faculty, Dr. T.B.S. Kobal from Hyderabad. And in the first session, he'll be talking on uh, femoral and lumbar plexus block. The next meeting, maybe in December, we'll have the second session on sciatic and sacral plexus block. I'm very happy and request uh, all the members to utilize this uh, rare opportunity. As uh, Dr. Jalil said, COVID has taught us a different lesson. And we are utilizing even that uh, adverse situation. I ho honestly welcome all the members on behalf of ISA Kerala State Chapter. And uh, I request uh, Dr. Venkatagiri to say a few words. Dr. Giri, please. Giri, please unmute. Eh? Uh, good evening. Uh... Uh, good evening, uh, President uh, ISA Kerala, ISA Malapuram Secretaries, uh, Past President Dr. Balabaskar and uh, Faculty Dr. V. S. Gopal and all the faculty members and friends. Uh, <clears throat> with this pandemic, as the President and uh, Elil told, we have learned more and uh, we are more academic now. Earlier, uh, we had to go to other places or hear lectures and all many times going but not hearing the lectures. But now in our free time, maybe in the evening or not at seven o'clock after fifteen days, we are more young like that. This is the today. See, we had already ICA lectures. We already had that uh, RSSCP lecture, and now we have this lecture, and it enriches our knowledge. So, uh, yeah, ISA Malappuram and ISA Kerala. Last time also had a good lecture. This time also having very good lecture. It will uh, help all the consultants, PGs, and practitioners alike, because now more and more. Uh, people are using uh, ultrasound and in their clinical practice. When I have got ultrasound machine for my hospital and I'm the learning curve. So it is more useful because we use it on every patient, see how it is uh, very useful and uh, all the best. And see that uh, uh, more uh, and more lectures will be there from ISA uh, Kerala, Malapuram and other branches in the coming time and help all the people. All the best, uh, President and uh, Thank you. Jalil. Shall we go to the academics? Uh, Balabaskar, sir. Balabaskar, sir, sir, few words, words please. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Jedi, you can control the meeting, please. Sir. Yeah, sir. Sir, uh, good evening, uh, uh, Nazar, sir. Good evening to Binil, uh, President and Secretary of uh, 
uh, ESA uh, Kerala State Branch, and of course uh, the organizing uh, uh, group consisting of Dr. Jalil and uh, Dr. Abu Bakar. Uh, congratulations for uh, conduct of this program, because uh, you have been able to uh, elicit the services and presentation from Dr. T V S Gopal. He is a luminary in uh, regional anesthesia. and uh, his uh, uh, lectures are uh, well received and uh, we people wait for to listen to his lectures and uh, meanwhile uh, also dr venkatagiri as uh, he was also telling has been instrumental in mobilizing our colleagues from different parts of the world and bring the academics to the drawing rooms of uh, all the members so that's one advantage of uh, uh, covid now so so nice of uh, you to 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 to, uh, to think of the academics in this season uh, congratulations once again and uh, dr tvs gopal good evening sir uh, i <laughs> will also be very happy to listen to your uh, session now uh, and uh, I, I, i am able to see two of the distinguished members dr kannan and dr bahab so my compliments to them from is academic committee and all the members of is kerala state and uh, rest of the viewers from other parts of the world thank you very much and all the best for the program thank you uh, dr benil will introduce uh, dr devias gopal sir then we can we can go for uh, his presentation thank you jalil yeah. thank you jalil uh, honorable president isa kerala state chapter dr abdul nasir sir past national president dr balabaskar national president elect dr venkatagiri senior leaders colleagues friends uh, actually uh, dr tvs gobal does not require any introduction for us he is one of the star world in the field of regional anesthesia he completed his md anesthesiology in 1991 from pj chandigarh he is the clinical director of department of anesthesia pain management and surgical intensive care of care hospitals hyderabad formerly he was the hod of anesthesia and critical care in global hospital hyderabad he was also worked as senior house officer in uk nhs and uh, specialist anesthesiologist in iran he is a well recognized reputed teacher for dnb anesthesiology he is a well known faculty for various national and international conferences he has a lot of research papers in regional anesthesia in reputed national and international journals he is the associated editor of regional anesthesia and pain medicine journal he is also peer reviewer of indian journal of anesthesia also associated ed editor of international journal of ultrasound and applied technologies in perioperative care he is the former president and pre present chairperson of academy of regional anesthesia of india and most importantly he is the found uh, founder managing director of axon anesthesia associates mm -hmm. private limited no, one of the largest on. corporate anesthesia service provider group in india established in 2001 comprising of 174 anesthesiologists catering to 14 leading hospitals in hyderabad five hospitals in bangalore mm -hmm. and three hospitals in chennai sir uh, congratulations and hats off for you for this mission and uh, nasir sir if you want to add something please go ahead actually i was uh, associated with dr avias kobal in his uh, advanced regional anesthesia workshop i was a regular uh, delegate for that uh, workshop this is one of the few workshop where they limit the number of people to 75 i i found that there were only 75 chairs in the hall except for the faculty so sir a very nice and very happy to hear uh, from your vast experience and welcome to malappuram and welcome to kerala over to the academic session dr tbs gobal please uh, thank you dr matthew uh, dr nazar uh, dr balabaskar and dr venkat giri for your kind words um, it's my pleasure to be speaking in the presence of dignitaries such as uh, dr balabaskar and uh, dr venkat giri Uh, this is a commitment uh, AORA has given Dr. Nazar. I mean, he's been asking us for a few years now that we must come to Kerala and he will do a grand workshop. 
but unfortunately the covid pandemic has uh, stolen us uh, of this uh, opportunity uh, but then um, we will uh, make do with uh, um, a webinar uh, which is as good all of us have become fairly adept at uh, connecting uh, on the internet so this is a wonderful opportunity uh, today, I'll be speaking to you as per the request of Dr. Nazar on femoral nerve and lumbar plexus blocks. And sometime next month, uh, as per the date which uh, uh, the Kerala ISA chapter will choose, uh, we will talk also about um, the uh, sacral plexus blocks. Um, as most of you know, unlike the upper limb, the lower limb is not innervated by nerves that emanate from a single plexus. In the upper limb, uh, branches of the I mean, brachial plexus, they virtually innervate the entire upper limb with uh, the exception of the shoulder and the inner aspect of the upper arm. But when it comes to lower limb, uh, you have branches that emanate from the lumbar plexus and also the sacral plexus. And if you need to perform any surgeries involving the lower limb uh, without doing a neuraxial block, you will need to do two blocks, one for branches of the lumbar plexus and the other for branches of the sacral plexus, which is why a spinal or an epidural became very, very popular because they're very easy to perform. All you need is a single injection in the back. But then over time, thanks to preventive uh, cardiology, lots of patients are on antiplatelet agents these days. And with the ubiquitous availability of peripheral nerve stimulation and ultrasound, more and more people are actually moving away from neuraxial blocks and want to target individual nerves or individual branches of uh, lower limb plexus. So we will begin with the femoral nerve. As you can see in this picture, um, the femoral nerve uh, is the largest branch of the lumbar plexus. It gains access to the anterior aspect of the thigh by passing under the inguinal ligament. And within the thigh, it lies immediately lateral to the femoral artery, which in turn lies lateral to the femoral way. And um, as soon as it enters the thigh, within four centimeters, the femoral nerve branches into of various branches. So it quickly arborizes into various branches. That is the right term to use when it comes to the branching of the femoral nerve. And as you can see in this picture, this is a cross section. This is the fascia lata, which we all know of. And this is the fascia iliaca. Now, the fascia iliaca separates the femoral nerve from the femoral artery. So this is a different compartment altogether. And as you can see here, the femoral nerve is not a, a round circular structure, just like you see uh, the sciatic nerve in the popliteal uh, fossa, but it is rather an elongated lip-shaped structure over here. And uh, it lies on top of the iliacus muscle, which is lined by the fascia iliaca here. So this is the compartment in which the femoral nerve exists. Now, as I said, the femoral nerve quickly divides within four centimeters after crossing the inguinal ligament. Here you can see a schematic uh, description. You have the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment. The anterior compartment will innervate the sartorius muscle and give off cutaneous branches, which are known as the anterior cutaneous branches. The posterior compartment will innervate the muscles. So the major motor component comes from the posterior compartment. And the largest cutaneous branch of the posterior branch of the femoral nerve 
which is the continuation of the femoral nerve as it goes down the thigh and into the leg is the saponous nerve, which is a purely cutaneous nerve. So here you can see that this posterior branch of the femoral nerve is innervating various muscles. Broadly speaking, the femoral nerve innervates the muscles that flex the hip, which is iliacus and pectineus, and also muscles that extend the knee, which is the quadriceps femoris group of muscles. The quadriceps femoris, as the name suggests, is a, a compendium of four muscles, which includes the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, the vastus intermedius, and the vastus medialis. So the femoral nerve, as uh, we spoke, is a mixed nerve, which has got both a sensory as well as a motor component. So here you will see the cutaneous supply that emanate from the anterior cutaneous nerves. So this portion, which is highlighted in dark gray, this is the portion of the anterior thigh that is innervated by the femoral nerve. So in this particular picture, we see the osteotomal supply of the femoral nerve, the muscular supply, as well as the cutaneous coverage. So once you have this sort of a picture in view, you will also be able to work out the indications for doing the femoral nerve block. So you will limit your femoral nerve block to the areas that are covered by the femoral nerve innervation. So that much is quite simple. Here you see the landmarks for the femoral nerve. This is the head end of the patient towards this side. This is the caudal side. So this particular line would be your inguinal ligament. And just distant to the inguinal ligament would lie the inguinal crease. That would be the femoral artery. And that would be the entry point. Just lateral to the femoral artery is where you are expected to place your needle. And uh, we tend to use peripheral nerve stimulation for uh, locating the femoral nerve. But before we put a needle within the skin, there is a device called the stimu pen, which is a percutaneous localizer. What we do is we put that stimu pen here on the skin, and this will send current and that will stimulate the femoral nerve. So the advantage of doing a percutaneous localization is that before you put the needle inside, you can mark the point of entry for your needle. So this is just a small video. So this is at one hertz, the frequency, and you can see the contraction of the quadriceps, and this particular sign is called the dancing patella. Now, this sometimes when you are localizing only the anterior branch of the femoral nerve, you get this medial twitch, which is the sartorial twitch. And this is not the twitch that you want. You want the contraction of the quadriceps femoris. So this is not the twitch that you should accept. Sometimes you get both the medial twitch as well as the contraction of the quadriceps. This is acceptable, but ideally the twitch that you're looking for is only involving the quadriceps. So here you can see, this is the inguinal crease. This is the anterior superior iliac spine. This is the femoral artery there. And this is how you place your needle, just distal to the inguinal crease, lateral to the femoral artery. It is tilted at about 45 degrees so that when the needle actually makes contact with the femoral nerve, it is superior to the inguinal crease at about the level of the inguinal ligament. So that is where you're targeting the femoral nerve before it has branched. So this is the sort of twitch that you will expect. This is the dancing patella, which is the contraction of the quadriceps. For about two decades now, we've all been using ultrasound 
And uh, the femoral nerve block with ultrasound guidance is classified as being a, a very basic block because it lies so superficial. And because the structure is so superficial, we use a high frequency linear transducer. And this is the image that you will expect to see. Uh, this was um, a, a block that I performed at uh, a workshop in which uh, Sandeep and Rushali were also there. This was in All India Institute uh, in New Delhi in 2015. Uh, this is an ultrasound guided uh, femoral block. I'm just going to play this. So here you can see that the femoral artery has already split, it is divided. So you don't want to perform your block at this level. You scan superiorly till you see a single artery. So you have the femoral artery and the profunda there. So we start scanning superiorly till you see a single artery. And if you just release the pressure of the probe, you will see the femoral vein coming in immediately. This is a branch of the femoral artery, which we call the lateral circumflex femoral artery. It is seen sometimes. This line on top, this is the fascia lata there. And this line coming below here, this is the fascia iliaca. And this lip-shaped structure here, this is the femoral nerve. It is lying on top of the iliacus muscle. This is the iliacus. So this is the fascia iliaca. This is the femoral nerve. Here you can see that the nerve is at quite some distance from the artery. If you were using PNS alone, you would have put your needle here and you would probably not have uh, got the twitch. So this is the needle going in plane with the ultrasound probe, which is placed in short axis overlying the uinal crease. That's the needle that's coming into view. It's gone past the latter. And shortly, I'll be going past the iliac also. I'll be lying on the anterior aspect. So when we do ultrasound guided blocks, with the non-dominant hand, we are holding the probe. With the dominant hand, we are introducing the needle. So somebody else doing the injection. So that's the nerve. You can see the nerve quite clearly after the local anesthetic is given. So the question from uh, Dr. Anjali, who was moderating this session is, do you also put your needle here, posterior to the nerve? Actually, it's not required. What the ultrasound is showing us is a two-dimensional image. But what happens within the body is a three-dimensional spread. So once the needle is placed in the vicinity of the nerve, it will encircle the nerve, probably when provided, it is placed exactly in the correct perineural position. So you don't need to actually place the needle anteriorly and then posteriorly also. So this is how an ultrasound guided femoral nerve block is performed. 
Now, when we come to the lumbar plexus, as I said earlier, there are two plexuses that innervate the lower limb. Uh, you have the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. The lumbar plexus takes its origin from the ventral rami of L1, L2, L3, and L4 roots. And uh, there are six branches of the lumbar plexus. Superior most will be the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. Then you have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh and the genitofemoral nerve, which in itself branches into the genital branch and the femoral branch. You have the largest branch of the lumbar plexus, which is the femoral nerve. And also you have the obturator nerve, which is uh, highlighted in blue, and it lies most medial. It is important to note that two branches arise from one root, two branches arise from two roots, and two branches arise from three roots. So the nerves that arise from one root, which is L1, are iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal. The nerves that arise from two roots are the lateral fem cutaneous nerve of thigh and genitofemoral nerve. And the nerves that arises from three roots, which is L3, L2, L3, and L4, are femoral nerve and obturator nerve. Sometimes there is a contribution from the subcostal nerve, which is T12. And sometimes there is also a contribution from L5, which is the lumbosacral trunk, which normally contributes to the sacral plexus. We will be talking about that in greater detail in my next lecture next month. On the right here, you see the psoas muscle. Over here, the psoas muscle has been dissected. And here you see the branches of the lumbar plexus after exiting the lumbar paravertebral space, they course inferiorly and laterally. And here you can see that the branches of the lumbar plexus lie at the junction of the anterior two-third and the posterior third of the psoas major. They run within the psoas major muscle at the junction of the anterior two-thirds and posterior third. The anterior two-thirds of the psoas major is quite fleshy, whereas the posterior third is more fibrous and tends to be tendinous. So this is a short axis uh, view of what you would see at the lumbar vertebra. This is the vertebral body there. This is the root that is emerging. And this is the lumbar plexus here. And this is the psoas major muscle. So this is anterior, this is posterior. So this is roughly at the junction of the anterior two thirds and the posterior third. This muscle here is the quadratus lumborum. This is the erector spinae group of muscles. Medial most would be the multifidus at the lumbar level. Lateral to that would be the longismus thoracis, and lateral to that would be the iliocostalis. So here you also see that there is an artery which is lying in close proximity to the lumbar plexus. This is the lumbar artery, and you also have ascending and descending lumbar veins in this uh, proximity of the emerging root. In 1973, Winnie and colleagues talked about a block which uh, they called the three-in-one block. They hypothesized that with a single injection, as we do for a femoral nerve block anteriorly, just distal to the inguinal ligament and lateral to the femoral artery, with a single injection, three nerves would be blocked. That is the femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh, and the operator nerve. They hypothesized that when you put the local anesthetic, the local anesthetic would be transported cephalad along a canal or some sort of a conduit. And this would spread cephalad to affect the other two nerves. But by 1995, cadaveric studies clearly showed that there is no such thing as a three-in-one block. So please don't use the term three-in-one block anymore. If at all the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh is blocked, 
it is because of lateral diffusion of local anesthetic and the operator nerve is almost always spared. In 1974, the same set of authors, Alon Vini and colleagues, talked about the posterior approach to the lumbar plexus and they used the landmark technique and the tactile feedback that one got when the needle made contact with the transverse process. Cheyenne and colleagues spoke about the loss of resistance technique in 1976, and soon thereafter, Parkinson and colleagues introduced peripheral nerve stimulation for performing lumbar plexus blocks. And it was in 2001 that Kirschmeyer and colleagues introduced ultrasound guidance. Today, the gold standard for performing a lumbar plexus block is a combination of ultrasound and nerve stimulation. But please keep in mind, because the lumbar plexus is fairly deep in location, using an ultrasound is not a problem for an expert like Sandeep uh, Devan. So this is uh, also called the psoas compartment block. When Cheyenne and colleagues spoke about this particular block, this is the psoas muscle there. This is the quadratus lumborum here. They thought that there was a compartment in between the psoas muscle and the quadratus muscle in which the branches of the lumbar plexus lay. But today we know that there is no such thing as a psoas compartment and that branches of the lumbar plexus course within the psoas muscle and not in a separate compartment. But even then, we continue to say psoas compartment block today, whereas the correct term is posterior approach to the lumbar plexus. Uh, here you can see the landmarks on the skin. On the left is the Winnie's approach. This is L4 vertebra. This is the posterior superior iliac spine. A line is drawn keflat from this PSIS and where it, it intersects this particular line, this is where Winnie put his needle and performed the block. Cap de Villa and Philip McCare, they modified this particular approach. So what they did is they put the needle at the junction of this line, that is the medial two thirds and the lateral third. And they noticed that when you put the needle here, the needle definitely made contact with the transverse process. Whereas here, it was likely that the needle would miss the transverse process and enter the psoas muscle uh, without even hitting the transverse process. Now, the depth from the skin to the transverse process depends on the patient's uh, weight and body habitus, but the depth from the transverse process to the lumbar plexus is fixed. It is not more than 2.2 centimeters. So once you hit the bone and you have redirected your needle, you should make sure that you should not introduce your needle more than one inch. So these are the landmarks I've uh, marked in a, a thin young boy. This is L5, this is L4, this is L3. This is the iliac crest there. This is the posterior superior iliac spine. This is the beginning of the intergluteal cleft. And this corresponding with this would be this particular uh, landmark, which is six centimeters distant to the PSIS. This is where we would put our needle for what we call the parasacral approach of Mansur for the sacral plexus. We'll talk about it later. So this is L4, and this is the entry point at the junction of the medial two thirds and the lateral third. So this is where I would put my needle when I'm doing a lumbar plexus block with peripheral nerve stimulation. So when you're using the nerve stimulator to perform a lumbar plexus block, you should be able to differentiate between the twitches that you get. Sometimes you will see that the twitch is limited to ipsilateral back muscles only. That means your needle is very superficial. It is within the erector spinae. You need to introduce it further. Sometimes you get a twitch only of the hamstrings. That means your needle is too caudal and you're stimulating possibly L5, which is the lumbosacral trunk. 
So you need to de redirect your needle a little kefalad. Sometimes you get only a flexion of the thigh. This means that you're directly stimulating the psoas muscle and you have gone past the lumbar plexus into the anterior third of the psoas muscle. So you need to redirect your needle by withdrawing it. And the acceptable twitch is the twitch of the quadriceps fibers, which is the dancing patella side. So here, I'll just play this short video for you. This is anterior hip contraction. You don't see a quadriceps contraction and the patella is not moving. So this is not what you want. So this is another video. The marking was a little wrong. This entry point should have been here. I stand corrected as far as this particular entry point is concerned. So this is a PNS guided uh, lumbar plexus block that I did. This is a peripheral nerve stimulator. So it can go up all the way to five milliampers of current. We start with one or even 1.5 is okay for lumbar plexus blocks. And once we get the twitch, we go down to 0.4 milliamps. And at 0.4, if we are still getting the twitch, that is acceptable. This is the anodal connection, positive to patient. This is the cathodal connection, needle to this particular point here. So this is a 100 mm block needle, which has got an injection port. And that is uh, the needle being placed. This is a post-op patient who had a hemir hip uh, arthroplasty. And once I get the quadriceps twitch there, so this is the sort of twitch you want going all the way down to the patella. And that is when you will ask your assistant to start injecting. And the moment they have done the aspiration, and begin the injection, you will see that the twitch disappears, which is what we call the positive Raj test. So here, this is a, a, a lady uh, who was uh, quite big. And uh, you can see that um, in this particular patient, you will expect to strike the transverse process at a greater depth when compared to a thinner patient. And this is how you would position the patient. The site to be operated will be up and it's more comfortable for the patient. We tend to put a pillow beneath uh, between the two legs. And um, as my needle is uh, entering, you can see that I'm focused on this aspect to pick up any contraction of the quadriceps. And here you can see that I've set my current to 1.5 milliamps. Uh, this was a patient uh, we had operated upon uh, just uh, two weeks ago. This 83-year-old man came to us from Assam. And as you can see, uh, he's got ankylosing spondylitis and uh, the, the neck is fused and it's fixed uh, virtually four uh, inches of the pillow. And um, he was for a bilateral total hip replacement sequentially, uh, and both the sites were to be performed one week apart. So we took him for the left hip, uh, uh, total hip arthroplasty, put him in the lateral position, and three of us tried to do a spinal in three different spaces with both uh, midline as well as paramedian approach, and no matter what we tried, we were getting more. So I went ahead, I did a lumbar plexus and sacral plexus block, and with just minimal sedation, uh, an infusion of dexmedetomidine, he underwent his procedure very well. And last week, a week after the first surgery, we brought him back to the theater and we put him right side up. And I did the same procedure again, the right sided lumbar plexus and sacral plexus block. And we managed to finish his right sided hip uh, replacement also. So this is the advantage of being able to do a lumbar and sacral plexus block. In patients in whom you fail to do a neuraxial block, uh, this adds uh, uh, another dimension to your 
parliamentarian. So once you have injected your local anesthetic, you will expect to see this sort of a fusiform spread of local anesthetic. Uh, the one problem with the lumbar plexus block is that it is the block with the highest bleeding risk. No other block that we perform has this high a bleeding risk as lumbar plexus block. Therefore, it is an advanced level block and it is not to be done by beginners. And one should be fairly adept at performing basic level and intermediate level blocks before they venture out to perform lumbar plexus blocks. And even so, it must be performed with your senior uh, colleague uh, standing right by you and guiding you. And this block, again, is not for patients who are on anticoagulation. Now, there are a lot of complications that you can potentially have with a lumbar plexus block. You can have an epidural spread because you are injecting so close to the lumbar paravertebral space. If you inject against resistance and if you inject too fast, then you can have an epidural spread which will anesthetize both the limbs. And um, in which case, uh, you can have uh, severe hypotension. But most often, there is mild hypotension. And that is because once the patient's pain is relieved, the sympathetic overdrive begins to relax with the uh, effect that the blood pressure of the patient tends to stabilize to lower levels. Flexopathy or neuropathy is possible, especially when you're injecting against resistance and the patient is complaining of shooting pain when the injection is being made. Local anesthetic systemic toxicity is uh, quite possible because as I showed you in one previous slide, there are lumbar arteries ascending and descending lumbar veins in the vicinity. So an inadvertent intravascular injection is always possible, which is why we ask the person who is injecting to intermittently aspirate to see that there is no blood coming into the injection port. Intraperitoneal injection is possible, um, especially if you do not hit the transverse process, uh, your needle could be uh, within the uh, intraperitoneal space before you know it. Retroperitoneal hematoma is uh, a direct consequence of uh, vascular injury. And uh, renal punctures have also been reported, especially on the right side, because the right side, the kidney is lower than on the left. And uh, this is why uh, lumbar plexus block is not meant for beginners. This was a very interesting study performed by Jeff Gadsden and colleagues and published in 2008. What they did is they took 80 patients coming in for hip arthroplasties, randomized them into two groups. In one group, they injected with normal pressures. And in the other group, they injected high pressures exceeding 20 pounds per square inch. And in the group where they had performed high pressure injection, if you see, the incidence of bilateral femoral block indicating an epidural was 60%. Incidence of a neuraxial block, probably a spinal, was 50%. And incidence of ipsilateral sciatic nerve block was 50%. Whereas with normal injection, there was absolutely no indication of all these three instances. I did say earlier, it was Kirschmeier and uh, Morigal and Kapral and colleagues who in 2001 used ultrasound for a posterior approach to the lumbar plexus block. They used two views, which is what we use today. One is, as you see, A, which is a paramedian long axis or sagittal view. This is the sort of image you will get. The other view is what they call the paramedian transverse view, and you will get this sort of image. It is interesting to note here that in the male, the iliac crest is at this level, and it will transect the interspace between L4 and L5, whereas in most females, the iliac crest is much lower down, 
and it will transect the interspace between L5 and S1. So as I said in the previous slide, there are two views when you perform a lumbar plexus block with ultrasound. This is a long axis or a sagittal view. This is a short axis or transverse axis view. And as shown here, we use a low frequency curved transducer. This is because, as I said earlier, the lumbar plexus is situated quite deep and you need a low frequency transducer because the low frequency ultrasound waves penetrate deeper into the tissue. So going to depths with a low frequency ultrasound transducer is much easier, but the only problem with using a low frequency transducer is that the quality of the image, which is what we call resolution, is not as good. So when you use uh, the probe in the paramedian long axis view, you're looking to identify the transverse process. So here in the picture on the left, this is the spinous process of the vertebra. On either side would be the laminae, and this would be the transverse process. So this green line is connecting the transverse processes of L2, L3, and L4. And here you can see that the probe is overlying the transverse process and it will insulate contiguous transverse processes and the space that exists between two contiguous transverse processes. So this is the probe. Closest to the probe would be the erector spinae muscle the transverse process being bone reflects ultrasound. So there is an acoustic shadow here, another acoustic shadow here, and another acoustic shadow here. So this looks like a trident. Manoj Karmakar has called this the ultrasound trident. We know that in Hindu mythology, Lord Shiva carries the uh, trident. And if you look at uh, Greek mythology, it is uh, Poseidon. So here, in between two transverse processes, you see the psoas muscle. This is anterior, this is posterior. And at the junction of the anterior two-thirds and the posterior third, somewhere here, this would be the root of the lumbar plexus that is moving into the psoas muscle. So this is the ultrasound trident one two and three there. And just playing this video for you, you can see the peritoneal contents and you can see the peritoneum move also here. And this is where you would expect to see the lumbar plexus. And when you perform a block using the paramedian long axis approach, you sit behind the patient, the machine is uh, placed across the patient and you're holding the probe here, the low frequency curve probe, uh, overlying the transverse process, as you can see here. And the needle goes in plane from cordat to kephalan. Now coming to the short axis or transverse view, there are two places where you can put your probe. One is immediately lateral to the transverse process, and one is you are placing it in the flank. So the two places you can put the probe is immediately lateral to the transverse process in short axis, and the other one would be to place it in the flank in short axis. Now, if you see here, this is called paramedian transverse oblique scan. It is oblique because you're obliquely tilting your probe to orient it towards the midline so that you can see the transverse process better. That is why it's So this is how I would place the probe just lateral to the transverse process with my non-dominant hand and my needle would go just here in plane with the ultrasound beam. There are two views that I can get. One is what we call the transverse process view, which is what we should look for first. So this shadow here is the transverse process. This would be the 
quadratus lumborum muscle here. This is the psoas muscle here. And this root emerging here, this is the lumbar plexus. But if your needle is coming from here, it will make contact with the transverse process. And then you have to orient your needle to come to the lumbar plexus, which is what we do with peripheral nerve stimulation. So to do away with that uh, problem, once you have identified the transverse process, you move your probe slightly cephalad so that you are looking at the articular process. So when your needle is coming in, without hitting the transverse process, it can come directly and stimulate the lumbar plexus. You will always use both ultrasound as well as peripheral nerve stimulation. This is a combined modality block. So this is how you would ensure ergonomics, the patient, with the operated side will be up, lies in lateral position. The probe is, I mean, the machine is placed across from you. You are sitting behind the patient. Uh, this is the peripheral nerve stimulator that is connected. This is the probe that is placed just lateral to the transverse process in short axis. And your needle is going in proximity to this transducer in plane with the ultrasound beam. So this is maintaining ergonomics while performing this particular block. And um, the second approach is by putting the probe in the flank. And as you can see, the needle will go at the same entry point and it, it is at a fair distance from the ultrasound transducer. Now, when you do this particular approach, you will want to see what you call the ultrasound chamra. This is the shamrock flower. As you can see, it has the stem and it has got three flowers there. The shamrock flower is uh, known to be the uh, national flower of the Republic of Ireland. So here, this is what is called the ultrasound shamrock. This transverse process is the stem of the flower. One flower is this, which is the quadratus lumborum muscle. The other clover is this, which is the erector spinae muscle. The third clover is this, which is the psoas major. And here you can see the lumbar plexus nerve root, which is exiting. Your needle will go from here and make contact with the transverse process and then go past it to go to the lumbar plexus. But here, if I just move my probe a little, I get the articular process view. So the needle can directly go to the lumbar plexus without hitting the transverse process. But this is an advanced level block. Very few people can actually do this. So this is the difference. When you put the probe just lateral to the transverse process, the needle goes very close to the probe. Whereas if you put it like this to image the shamrock, one, two, three, and this would be the stem there, the needle is going at a certain distance from the probe. Uh, a short video, you don't actually pick up the needle. This is the transverse process there. This is the vertebral body. This is the psoas muscle there. On top would be the quadrant slumber. As the drug is being injected, can you see the spread that's coming here? And you can see the lumbar nerve root, that white line which is seen much better. So this is just to demonstrate that it is possible to do it with ultrasound. As you inject more and more drug, you can see the lumbar plexus, that white line, which is becoming very, very clearly visible. And this is the local anesthetic, which has been injected into the belly of the psoas major muscle. Uh, this was an article that was uh, presented by Manoj Karmakar, nothing uh, that we don't already know. They combined uh, a lumbar plexus block with a parasitical sciatic block for uh, performing a hip fracture surgery in a patient with severe aortic stenosis. I think one of our postgraduates is going to present this particular uh, talk now, I mean, this particular uh, uh, case scenario to us, and we'll discuss it. And um, um, so with uh, Sri Prakash and I, we've uh, presented our experience with uh, a combination of uh, these blocks for uh, patients with hip fractures. So have uh, Sandeep and uh, colleagues. But please do remember, this is an advanced level block and it is to be performed only by 
uh, a senior by your side, especially if you're a, a resident in regional anesthesia. And if you're beginning, it's also better to avoid doing this particular block. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm done with my talk and uh, I'm okay to take um, any questions from the audience or we can move on to the case presentations. So I think we'll, we'll take up a few questions or a few comments. Uh, sure. First. Uh, Balavaska sir, you have something to add for this? Balavaska sir is there? Hello? Dr. Balavaska is there? Okay. We have two questions from the chat box. One is uh, from Dr. Fias, uh, that is, is there any modification to perform posterior approach of lumbar plexus block? with landmark or PNS guidance in a kyphos coleotic spine? That's the first question, sir. Not that I know of. Um, I've been reading a bit of uh, literature. Um, I don't think uh, there is any particular modification which has been suggested. Uh, using an ultrasound in these uh, spines would be probably a good idea because uh, it will give us an indication of where the transverse process is and where exactly we need to place the needle under the skin. Uh, but is there a documented uh, modification uh, to the posterior lumbar plexus block? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it is not there. Okay, thanks. I think that, that's, that clears that. The second question, can the femoral nerve block bed used in post of analgesia in surgery of island tibia or post of analgesia in fracture hip surgery? No, one is uh, fracture hip surgery. And what was the first one uh, you said? Post of analgesia in surgery interlocking tibia. Interlocking tibia, no, because yes. if you see the slide I had presented on the cutaneous innovation, beneath the knee joint, it continues along the medial aspect of the leg as the saphenous nerve. So for interlocking nail of tibia, if you want to uh, give a block for post-op analgesia, the preferred block would be a sciatic block. Um, sir, but uh, for hip fracture surgery, definitely yes. Sir, probably his confusion has arise because uh, the medial side of the skin is supplied from the femoral nerve. So probably yes, from that, that the, the confusion has started, the concept of uh, dermatome, myotome, and osteotome. Can you just highlight a few words on that? Probably the confusion has come from that point. Uh, I'll just uh, play that one particular slide again and uh, highlight it for you so that uh, we can clear that. Uh... Okay. Uh, see, in this particular slide, you can see that it innovates almost the entire femur with the exception of the greater trochanter. And medially, if you can see here in the leg, it is only innovating this area as far as osteotome is concerned. But if you see the cutaneous innovation, it is going below the knee joint along the medial aspect only. So definitely, this is not a block for analgesia or surgical anesthesia for procedures that are performed below the knee joint. Okay. But for no. the hip, yes. No, there are some more questions. One is uh, how much ml of local anesthetic you use for lumbar plexus and its concentration, whether you are using any additives for lumbar plexus? Uh, I personally do not use additives. I've been quite against uh, the use of additives. Uh, first and foremost, additives do not have FDA approval. So whenever we use an additive, uh, which is admixed with local anesthetic for uh, a peripheral nerve block or a plexus block, 
it is only an off label indication long term neurological side effects nobody knows um what the textbook says we inject 25 to 30 ml of local anesthetic when we do a lumbar plexus block so i typically do lumbar plexus blocks for surgical anesthesia so i inject about 25 ml of 0.375% bupivacaine i don't add any additive to that and sometimes when we need uh, the analgesia to extend for a couple of days we also put a catheter okay and uh, sir, uh, sir you can repeat it sir uh, volume and percentage of the solution uh, if it is for surgical anesthesia you will want a higher concentration of the drug but if it's for analgesia alone post operatively you can go for a lower concentration of the drug i mean 0.125% bupivacaine or 0.25% bupivacaine is okay or even 0.2% propivacaine but for surgical anesthesia which is what i do uh, lumbar plexus blocks most often i tend to mix 20 ml of 0.25% bupivacaine 20 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine in a bowl so you will have 40 ml of 0.375% bupivacaine so from that we inject 25 ml but we always advise that the injection should not be finished within a few seconds you should do intermittent aspiration and inject over at least 3 minutes if you do a rapid injection you will see that the patient will end up with an epidural yeah sir that is true the force of injection is very important and uh, you have described uh, various method the loss of resistance and the nerve stimulators and ultrasound so many people have the doubt that what, what is your choice of method for lumbar plexus block lumbar plexus block i have been doing virtually all blocks with peripheral nerve stimulation only in some cases where i expect a difficult anatomy i also use ultrasound and sometimes when my residents insist that they want to see a dual modality procedure i use ultrasound and quite often after i have injected the local anesthetic to see the spread of local anesthetic in the psoas muscle i also use ultrasound but my personal preference is to use peripheral nerve stimulation okay sir uh, dr fabin she is working in a trauma center i usually use lumbar plexus block with a parasacral sciatic block for high risk patients for ortho surgeries for hemiarthroplasty for uh, past 4 years it works well uh, we she gives mild sedation and usually she use 23 to 26 ml for lumbar plexus that that's our comment on that and uh, from dr nazir how much time is required to complete the block maybe he is uh, meaning that how much time it takes the block to act for a surgical procedure for a surgical procedure i would give a minimum of 20 minutes so if it is a hemiarthroplasty or a total hip arthroplasty the patient will remain in the same position so that's not a problem and by the time the surgeons clean drape and start the procedure it is at least 25 minutes so you should give at least 20 minutes because you are not targeting one particular nerve you are targeting branches of the lumbar plexus which lie across the psoas muscle so you have to give at least 25 to 30 minutes before the surgeon puts his incision another concern that uh, is the femoral nerve block leads to motor deficit in the post op period definitely sir no in the post op period so, if the block is you a lumbar plexus block or a femoral block you will have quadriceps palsy and you will also have palsy of the muscles that flex the hip joint so which is pectineus and iliacus so that is a problem with femoral nerve block 
Another question is, uh, what is the difference between femoral and fascia iliaca in terms of the needle placement? Some insight into the pen block also. That's actually a different topic, but definitely you can comment on the first part of the question. I can just show the slide. Um, can you see the slide? No, sir, it does not, it does not come. So just a minute, I'll, I'll start screen share. Yeah, this particular slide. Now here, it's very, very clear. Yeah. This is the iliacus muscle. This is the fascia iliaca, which lies no, about. Not, not Please visible. don't see. You can't see the slide? No, sir. No, sir. It says I, I am screen your sharing. Screen. See your screen, but not. Let me start screen share again. Can no, you see? Screen is visible, sir. Screen is visible. Yeah. Uh -huh. you, you can select one slide, just load it to one, because all your slides are visible in a single screen setting. Is that better? You have selected it, but you can just double, maybe double click or something like that. I have actually. Uh, but in any case, in case you can't see it also, what I'm trying to say is the femoral nerve sits on top of the iliacus muscle. The iliacus muscle is lined by the fascia iliaca. So when you do a fascia iliaca block, you are typically using a blunted needle, for example, an epidural needle. And you're looking for two pops. One pop when the needle goes past the fascia lata, and the second pop when it goes past the fascia iliaca. So you're injecting your drug in between the fascia iliaca and the iliacus muscle. So that's the difference between doing a femoral block and the fascia iliaca block. Sir, any advantage of uh, using the supraimpinal route for fascia iliaca? Because that's the block. Iliaca, the supraimpinal uh, approach has been shown to consistently block both the peripheral nerve I mean, the, both the femoral nerve as well as the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of time. So that is the supposed advantage of doing a supraingoinal fascia iliaca block. But I would say a fascia iliaca block is more for orthopedic surgeons and emergency physicians who do on-arrival blocks in the emergency room. As an anesthetist, when you have an ultrasound, you are better off targeting the nerves individually than injecting between a muscle and some fascia. And that's even, my are they, they recommend to do the blind block because uh, even with blind block fascia iliaca, reasonable analgesia is produced in nearly two-thirds yes, of the patients. Reasonable analgesia will be there. So that is how the concept of fascia iliaca block started so that you could do it on arrival by uh, clinicians who are not so trained to doing nerve blocks. Another question is, uh, any surgery possible with the lumbar plexus block alone? Well, uh, lumbar plexus block alone, it would be taking a risk. I mean, if you are doing a, a femoral uh, surgery, for example, probably uh, an IM nailing of uh, the femur can be done with a lumbar plexus block, or probably some um, muscle or skin surgeries involving the uh, medial aspect of the anterior thigh. But uh, besides that, I don't think it's possible to do anything major without also blocking the sacral plexus because the sacral plexus contributes to the posterior innovation of the hip joint, uh, which so is what... About, uh, 
the surgery on the cordyceps muscle just like cordyceps cut injuries or patella surgeries can you do it with the lumbar plexus alone not the surgery that is eh? an overkill no it's a very complicated block for such a simple uh, let's say a muscle biopsy from the quadriceps muscle you can do it uh, with the femoral nerve block which is easier and safer to perform sir in femoral nerve block uh, if there is uh, always a very high chance that uh, you may miss the obturator nerve block especially when they are going for a anteromedial incision there is a chance that your your obturator in a few at least in a few patients it may come there and makes the sensory innervation you can take it from me you almost always miss it because the obturator nerve lies in a different compartment altogether yes yes so it's better to if you are planning for such a surgery on the patella and or it's better to go for a lumbar plexus if you are really experienced than for a femoral block is it yes. <laughs> Not do that. I would not because a lumbar plexus block takes time. You need some expertise, and you need the surgeon to be very patient while you wait for the block to set in. Whereas a femoral block will set in much faster. I would rather target the femoral nerve and obturator nerve individually, finish the entire block in less than three minutes. Whereas with a lumbar plexus block, positioning, cleaning, doing the landmarks on the skin, and it takes time. it's you cannot do it very fast and uh, there is another question what uh, milliampere of current is acceptable for pns guided in femoral nerve block i have one more point to add for that uh, yes. what is the minimum current acceptable for a lumbar plexus block where you go safely as a second part of this question okay For a femoral nerve block, uh, it's all right to start with one milliampere because uh, the nerve is very, very superficial. But for a lumbar plexus, we typically start with one point five milliamperes because it is not only deep, but you are looking at several branches. So that is the first part of your question. And what was the second part? I'm sorry. Um, You said you, you will give the block at uh, 0.5 milliamperes. Yes. Suppose suppose you are getting a stimulus still at a lower level, will you be a bit, little more cautious? With the lumbar plexus block, I would not try to redirect by needle because sometimes you get a twitch, you try to re redirect it, you lose the twitch. So what I would probably do is. if i still get the twitch at 0.2 milliamperes which uh, in almost all instances indicates intraneural placement of the needle i would still ask my assistant to inject a small amount of low intensity and if the assistant does not complain that they are meeting a lot of resistance while doing the injection and if the patient is not complaining of shooting pain while the injection is being made i think uh, i would not bother there is a comment that uh, skin graft and tantrum bud surgeries can be done with the lumbar plexus alone is it okay yes, yes you can because it's covering the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh and obturator nerve also so it is possible technically yes and uh, during the 20 minutes will you keep the patient in the lateral position for the minutes you, you wait for surgery to start will you keep it in the same position probably i would keep the patient in the same position in which i did the block because if you move the patient and put the patient supine before the block has set in and once the patient says i can feel pain you can take it from me uh, the moment the skin incision is given the patient will still complain of pain so i think it's best to leave the patient alone till the block totally sets can there be situation where the block gets spared at certain point intraoperatively block getting spared at certain point intraoperatively prompting us to adopt plan b 
Suppose the block fails during the surgery, do we have any other plans? Any blocks or you have to go for a general anesthesia? Maybe that because question. Because the patient would be under drapes, the patient could be in supine or lateral position, and uh, there is no way you can perform another rescue block. So depending on the magnitude of pain that the patient is complaining, you either give total GA or you sedate the patient. There is no other option. After the surgery has started, there is no way you can do a rescue block. <laughs> there is no way you can do anything else. That's true. And uh, this is a practical question. R lumbar plexus for proximal femoral nailing in uh, intertrochanteric fractures. What are dermatomes are spared for surgical anesthesia? Do you use a local infiltration or supplement with any other blocks for sparing? Yes, um, local supplementation probably will not work, but you will have to block the subcostal nerve That's and also uh, branches of the uh, sacral plexus, which innervate the posterior uh, aspect of the hip joint. But that said, in thin patients, because most of the painful innervation of the hip is anterior innervation, which takes about 60% of the total innovation. With local infiltration in some patients, we have pulled off with only a lumbar plexus alone. Okay, that's good. If you have only USG available, what type and size needle do you suggest for performing femoral nerve block and lumbar plexus block respectively? Maybe he, he doesn't have the stimulating needle. Just for USG alone. It doesn't have a peripheral nerve stimulator. Yes. If, if you don't have a peripheral stimulator, my sincere advice to you is don't do a lumbar plexus block with ultrasound guidance alone. No. But if you want to do a femoral nerve block, no issue. You need a 50 mm insulated needle. That's more than enough because it's a very superficial structure. And even in uh, obese patients, uh, at a depth of 5 centimeters, you will be able to comfortably locate the femoral nerve. And now, the duration, suppose you are putting 20 ml of BPVAC in 0.5 percentage. What is the duration of post of energies here? Not less than 12 hours. My blocks usually last around 16 hours. Okay. Especially when we do lumbar plexus blocks, patients are comfortable the next morning. Yes, sir. That was a, I, I, I think most of the questions we have covered. Uh, that was a wonderful session. We really enjoyed uh, sharing your uh, clinical experience. Now we'll, we'll have a very short case presentation. Some of the highlights, uh, TVS sir has, has already mentioned regarding that case. I think he will put up some more details on that. Dr. Sana Fatima, please uh, present your case very short. Dr. Sana, Jadil can unmute or Swayab can unmute Dr. Sana. She, she can present the case. She, uh, she is our uh, second year DNB student. Okay, Sana, please. Dr. Sana, you can proceed. Yes, sir. Can you see the slide? Yeah, it's clear. Yeah, definitely. It's nice. You, you can go to the slideshow. Yes, That's yes, visible. Yes. Okay. okay, fine. Go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, my case for today is uh, an 83-year-old uh, female uh, who is a known case of type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, COPD on treatment. She presented to us with a periprosthetic fracture, shaft of femur, right side, and the details of the previous surgery was not known. She gives history of uh, dyspnea on excision, and there is no history of orthopnea and PND. On examination, she had clubbing. Uh, pulse rate was around 92 per minute, low volume, uh, regular, with no radioradial or radiofemoral delay. BP was 170 over 100 in a supine position, and a respiratory rate 22 per minute. 
Uh, CVS apex bead was normal in position, heaving in character. Palpation of the aortic area showed a systolic thrill, uh, which was radiating to the carotid artery. S1 heard, S2 muffled, and uh, ejection systolic murmur grade 5 was heard during auscultation, which was radiating towards carotid, uh, heard over all cardiac areas and prominent on aortic area. Respiratory system, uh, this was barrel shaped and uh, bilateral air entry was decreased on auscultation and examination of GI and CNS revealed no abnormality. Pre-op investigations, uh, uh, the blood counts were normal, RBS was elevated and uh, serum electrolytes normal and RFT normal. Uh, this was a ECG, it showed sinus rhythm and a T inversion in L1, AVL and V4 to V6. This was a chest extra of the patient. And this is the extra of the limb. A pre-op cardiology evaluation was done and the echo showed concentric LVH, uh, no regional wall motion abnormality, uh, severely calcific aortic valve with severe aortic stenosis. There was mild AR or TR and uh, there was no pH with good LV function and a grade two diastolic dysfunction. So my question is uh, how to proceed with the patient? What anesthesia, how to do? So what, what is the ideal anesthetic, ideal safe anesthesia, anesthesia for this patient? It's a major procedure where there's an implant failure and there will be a lot of bleeding also. So TBS sir, can you just discuss on this? So we have handled uh, quite a few patients uh, with this sort of uh, similar pathology. Um, elderly, frail patients with uh, significant um, aortic uh, stenosis. Now, as we know, this is a low fixed uh, cardiac output state and uh, aortic stenosis takes a few decades to become clinically manifest. So the danger that there could be associated concomitant coronary artery disease is very high. And in this person, uh, we've not done any stress testing of the heart uh, uh, in terms of a dopamine stress echo or an adenosine spect. So uh, significant So we have not uh, uh, done stress testing of the heart. So whatever technique we adopt should be uh, the safest possible. And um, one, I would begin uh, with informed consent where I would counsel the family that uh, this is a high risk procedure uh, because the association of a hip fracture with mortality is extremely high. It's the highest for any known fracture. 10% uh, of patients, as per statistics in the UK, die within 28 uh, days of uh, surgery. And 28% uh, of patients die within 365 days after surgery. So while taking informed consent, it's very important that we counsel the family well. I would certainly place an arterial line in this patient because uh, a beat-to-beat -beat monitoring of blood pressure I would see is very important. I would mildly sedate the patient, put the patient in lateral position with the bad side up, and I would proceed to do a lumbar and sacral plexus block. Uh, that in trained hands is the safest approach. When you could do an epidural, you could put a catheter, you could do a sequential epidural, but the incidence of sympathetic block leading to hypotension is higher with an epidural and definitely it's worse with a spinal, even if it's a low dose spinal. So my um, preference would be to do a lumbar plexus and sacral plexus block. Yeah. <laughs> There are a few case reports uh, regarding this case. Maybe very few case reports where they did that under a combination of lumbar erectus spinae and QL block. There are three or four case reports. I don't know whether we will be confident of going with that. So
Sir, what about uh, the 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 VSP? People yeah, yes. have used transmuscular quadratus lumborum, yeah. lock, which they say will definitely you will have a spillover of local anesthetic to affect the lumbar plexus. Yeah. But these have not been conclusively proven. They have been case reports. They have been limited case series. But uh, we don't really know whether they will provide surgical anesthesia. When they tell you, when you read a case report, we have done this particular surgery with a lumbar erector spinae block. They don't really mention how much uh, of sedation they have used. That's so I think it's best when we talk at meetings that we talk, especially when juniors are there, when they are listening and they would want to take home some message from you that you talk of a time-tested approach rather than an experimental approach which has not been known to us for too long. So can we use a continuous final? I have, I have no experience, but just asking a doubt, can we go for a continuous final if you have some experience? We don't do continuous finals, but if you, uh, you were there at our workshop, uh, Dr. Nazar, you saw Dr. Amjad Mania from Bangalore do a continuous final. Yes. And uh, it is said that hemodynamically, a continuous final is much more stable than a single shot spinal. I personally don't have uh, great experience, so I would not do it. See, ultimately, you have to do what you are comfortable doing, what your surgeon allows you to do, and what your institution and the support services that you have. Based on all of that, you have to take your decision. Suppose you are doing it in a remote hospital, and you don't have a peripheral nerve stimulator. I mean, you will just do a low-dose spinal. But it will be risky for this patient. You have to send to a center where they have such a facility, especially the case. That would be the best that. always. See, I think it's best to be practical and accept uh, if there are certain uh, lacunae within our system and ship the patient to a higher center where the patient will get the best possible uh, care. So when you give a, a, a combined sacral and lumbar blocks, how much volume do you use it for each? I typically use 24 ml for the lumbar plexus and 16 ml for the sacral plexus. Total 40. 0.375. I, I, don't, I don't exceed uh, uh, 40 ml. Yes, 0.375. Any experience with uh, levo bpyacane? There is one question on that. Instead of bpyacane, levo bpyacane? If there is one drug that really, really failed to take off as a local anesthetic, it is levobifem. <laughs> so I really don't know much about it. Uh, but I must tell you, in 2009, uh, Dr. Manju Bhutani from um, um, Bombay, Dr. Vijay Vora from uh, Delhi, uh, Dr. Raghavendra from Chennai and I, we were taken by Abbott to Shanghai for the Asian launch of uh, levobifem care. And um, we hardly ever used it. Ropivacaine? Ropivacaine, I typically use for uh, post-op analgesia, 0.2%. A higher concentration, 0.5 or 0.75 for surgical anesthesia, will it work uh, as good as bpivacaine or what is your comment? I'm on? sure it will. But uh, I think everybody has their own preferences, their own quirks. I am quite partial to uh, BPO game. I've been using it for so many years. It works, so I stick with it. I'm sure 0.5% uh, or 0.75% uh, Rupiva game will be as effective. Okay, sir. We really enjoy uh, that uh, academic session. Any comments from Dr. Giri or Dr. Balabas? Sir, uh, one more Dr. question Giri? is there. Sir, one more question is there in the chat box. Last question. Local anesthesia. Uh, how much ml per hour rate of infusion for femoral yes. nerve for post-operative analgesia? Post-op analgesia, um, I would go anywhere between 5 to 10 ml. Um, if you are using a 
a programmable pump, then it becomes very easy. But if you are using an elastomeric pump, usually they have fixed uh, infusion rates. You will have 5 ml per hour or 10 ml per hour. So you have to choose the right uh, pump. So typically 5 ml per hour should be enough. And sometimes when there is breakthrough pain, especially when the surgeon mobilizes the patient, we can give a small bolus, 5 ml as a bolus. One more question just appeared. The femoral nerve catheter seating for continuous post-op pain in a femur fracture. Maybe he means uh, fixation. Yes, it should be uh, fairly effective. Because if you see the osteotomal distribution and the, uh, the muscle uh, uh, innovation of the femoral nerve, as long as the incision goes through the quadriceps and uh, they are operating on the femur, it will give uh, analgesia. Now, will you put a, a subcutaneous th uh, tunneling and is there any possibility of catheter leak? Catheter leak is always there. Uh, I do subcutaneous tunneling. I mean, recently we uh, started working with a surgeon who is insisting on uh, femoral nerve or adductor canal catheters for all his knee surgeries. So we tend to uh, do subcutaneous uh, tunneling. What sedation is your choice for lumbar plexus? I, since most of these patients are elderly and sick, um, if they are comfortable, I don't sedate. I just leave them alone. Some patients are uh, quite uh, anxious. They talk a lot which disturbs the surgeon. So I start them on Dexmed. I don't give a loading dose. I just start off with the maintenance dose and continue it during the surgery. Can we use the femoral nerve block for a positioning for neuroaxial block to reduce the pain of the fractures? That is what we always do. I mean, off late, we have started doing Peng also, but uh, give a femoral nerve block, wait for 10 minutes, and then seat the patient. They sit comfortably. So what is, so what is your experience about pen block? Any, any advantage or disadvantages compared to the femoral or facial yaka? The biggest advantage is it blocks only the articular branches. Yeah, no so, motor block. There's no motor block. But analgesia is excellent. We are given for some cases analgesia is good. Exactly. So there is no accompanying motor deficit. So that is the biggest advantage of a fine. We are given for a few cases and uh, our results are really encouraging for us. Yeah. Dr. No, Balas, please, sir. Is there any? No, sir, it's not there, sir. Sir, it's not there. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to being with you again next month. Once you fix up your date, uh, do let me know. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good night. Before winding, up, sir, before winding up, we got an announcement. Okay. ISA Kerala State Chapter is organizing a PG update program, a training program program for PG students on every Saturday's evening at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So it will be a continuous program, which will, uh, the inauguration will be held on next Saturday. So I welcome all the PGs to our program. Nasazar, anything to add? Yeah, that's fine. That's a program we already had uh, just before the DNP exam, and uh, we are committed to do it uh, over the next one year for all postgraduates with uh, eminent faculties uh, all over the country. We welcome you all for that uh, session. So, okay. Saturday we will uh, begin with a thyroid case, and there will be case discussions, um, um, case scenarios, drug, um, uh, then theory topics, OSCE, OSCEs. Uh, all all, uh, all the topics which will, which will be we will be covering over the year, and uh, if uh, Girisar is there, Girisar, please. No, I am there. I am there. I am there. Please, please add something, sir. Your comments. You have told everything. Nothing more. <laughs> uh. We have uh, our uh, beginning of state program and. Uh, Next uh, Thursday, that is on 26th, we have a CME by speakers uh, from all over India. We have five speakers, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar speaking on uh, 
post covid patients for elective surgery uh, anesthetic considerations then dr indrani hemant kumar talking on uh, failed spinal in a difficult uh, airway patient and uh, dr uh, rebecca jacob talking on uh, cleft lip palate anesthesia for children with cleft lip and palate elsa varg is talking on uh, laparotomy in infants uh, emergency laparotomy in infants and uh, one more is uh, dr manimala rao speaking on a burnout in uh, anesthetist and uh, uh, intensivist these are the five topics evening 6:30 to 9:30 and uh, chair persons are uh, uh, dr v m divekar past president dr uh, manjeet sire past president dr sunanda gupta past president above and dr uh, uh jersey soj and from kerala we have sarama ma'am and uh, hey jalil yes yeah, sir there is uh, one more question sir how can we see the effect of the block i think tvs has already left what is it to be used for femoral nerve block if sir is not that you can answer sir this is a very cr a crucial question because uh, when you give a block especially the femoral block the obturator nerve sensation is not ideal to check because that is the nerve which shows uh, maximum variability in its sensory supply and in at least uh, one third of the patient it does not have a sensory innervation so to check the femoral component the best thing is to check the sensation over the great saphenous the sensation over the the medial anteromedial thigh and the sensation over the medial aspect of the leg the shin but when you want to check the obturator nerve it is ideal to check for the adduction the motor part then going for the sensory because mm -hmm. the sensation has got the highest anatomical variation and sometimes it may not have the sensory fibers lateral cutaneous nerve of course you can check on the lateral aspect just below the greater trochanter on its upper part of the thigh i think that clears that answer another request is to share the link for pg definitely we will be doing that now itself i'll share now itself i'll share because uh, that that will be an ongoing good session for all the post graduates we are really happy that uh, many of us many of you are, you are you are really really enjoyed and your feedback is really encouraging for us to organize such an excellent program we welcome you to the next meeting maybe in december by dr tvs gobal alone on uh, sacral plexus and sciatic nerve block now over to jalil uh, yes sir pro, uh, link for the program pg program i have already shared in the chat box you can copy from the chat box if somebody is interested it's already shared sir yes, feedback please. from ms medical college also it was very good sir for last exam going batch it was uh, very good <laughs> for a uh, vinils uh, pg training program thank you uh, i think we can conclude the session sir with your permission i invite uh, dr shoebin abubakar for word of thanks hello everyone uh, it's with a great pleasure that uh, i'm coming in front of you uh, with uh, such a nice class i was listening to the class and all the questions were wonderful so uh, from the bottom of my heart and on uh, behalf of isa malappuram i would like to thank uh, dr tvs gobal sir for uh, taking time out of his busy schedule and sharing with us his thoughts and wisdom in such a simple and beautiful manner thank you so much sir next i would like to uh, thank uh, dr nasir sir our uh, isa state president for making this happen he is uh, relentless in the pursuit of knowledge and uh, i know that he is uh, very much interested in regional anesthesia and it is uh, such a good blessing for all of us next i would like to thank uh, dr binil sir his uh, energy is just uh, limitless and uh, he is up for a challenge any time and uh, thank you so much sir for uh, licensing with us and helping uh, us with all these things next i would like to thank uh, dr venkatagiri sir 
and uh, for his association with the branch always and he has been uh, so helpful for us next i would like to thank uh, dr jalil my uh, president for uh, conducting these sessions and for uh, making me do all these things that he is making me do and it's really an honor to work with him i would also like to uh, thank uh, dr sana for uh, presenting the case thank you uh, dr sana and next i would like to thank almost the 200 people who attended the session um, on zoom platform and to the 30 people who attended the session on uh, youtube and uh, thank you everyone if i have left out anyone that is not intentional you forgive me and i think uh, jerry sir we can wind up the session with that yes okay yeah. jerry you can make it close the meeting sir okay. thank you thank yeah. you all good night yeah, thank you so much good night, good night. Okay. okay see you